So to complete uh, assignment 2.1, you're simply going to respond to the link. And depending on what you're working with, in most cases, you'll want to download the first option, unless you're running on a portable device that uses an ARM processor. Um, you, you won't need to worry about uh, getting this from the Microsoft Store. That would be to install it through the store into your, your other view, and we're not going to do that. We want the full enchilada right here instead of that. You'll notice that there are a range of tools that help you deal with uh, primarily with running services and pipes and uh, helps you helps you get uh, specific information about ill-behaved processes. So proc dump. You will find that there are two of these tools in particular that receive the most play, okay? And um, I'm not gonna spoil that for you, but basically um, the recommended content is very much worth your time. So this is one of those, you get more out of a thing if you put more into a thing. And um, if you spend a little time exploring the different options, you'll also see some additional uh, links for the solution in module two that uh, include walkthroughs for some of these tools and how best to use them. And it's one of the things that I would encourage you to set aside time to do where you have fewer distractions, but you'll notice these two right here are very uh, plainly listed in regular English instead of all the other um, camel case uh, descriptions. And, and this, is, um, this is where the fun begins, process explorer and process mon monitor. Um, I'm going to go ahead. Post this right now so that you can get started. This is how I, I post these things. The due date will be 2 2 and it'll be 11 o'clock. There'll be two points. Any questions about what we've just posted? No questions. So at the end of last week, we finished up chapter three and uh, it was a review of pipes. So you have uh, two different flavors of pipes which one is trickier to set up but more secure and which one is more powerful or easier to use in a broader range of contexts? Does anyone remember this? Okay. I remember the name types are uh, what they call more powerful and apply yes. to a broader. Yes, the named pipes. The named pipes are the ones that are considered to be more powerful, but I think they're more like a loaded gun. They're easier to use and you can work between processes where a parent-child relationship is not previously established, which means they're more flexible. Um, but it also means that it would be a, a better universal resource. We wanna leave uh, our review of processes um, not in the rear view mirror, but more like on the back burner. Because uh, threads and concurrency is uh, a very important set of concepts that we need to consider alongside uh, process management. And uh, essentially, our goal today is to review as much of this as possible. So we want to explain what a thread really is as a fundamental unit of CPU utilization, right? 
you, you must remember that each process by default has to have a primary thread, right? So you can't really have a process without a thread. And that's another aspect of threads that kind of uh, makes a great segue into our review today. There are APIs for the different operating systems. So uh, pthreads, Windows, and Java, um, pthreads would be more commonly found in Unix, Linux. We're going to explore several strategies that provide for implicit threading and look at multi-threaded programming and then uh, review support for threads in Windows and Linux. Any questions about our goals? So the motivation for a review of threading kind of flows from the idea that processors are not single core processors. You have multiple CPUs in hardware now, even the most um, basic and low cost of processors include multiple cores. The idea that you can concurrently juggle and multitask is really attractive. Although I will say that I, I, I really wish that your generation, and I'm not trying to generalize here, but correct me if I'm wrong, if you open your browser, you have more than three or four tabs open. Would that be a correct generalization for each of you? Hello? Yeah, for me. Okay, so Deanna says yes for you. How about you, Luke? Would you have more than three or four tabs open on a browser? No, I do not. You don't? Wow. My compliments. I mean, not that it's a problem if you do, but it's kind of like the name pipes, right? You're all over. The, if you have lots of tabs open. Shanoa, how about you? Uh, typically, yeah. You do. Okay. And... Shinoa, are you working on a Mac or a Windows PC these days? Windows. Okay. All right. Very good. So threads run within an application. Most modern applications are multi-threaded. But I want to show you something here. And this kind of speaks to why, um, why we are motivated to dive deeper into threads. Can everybody see this screen here? Yes. Right, so we have four logical processors, right? Two physical cores and two logical processors or hyper-threaded processors. What you don't see, now this is just the general load let's look at the open resource monitor here this shows generically cpu load in total and if i go to cpu now i see a different view so here's the total cpu activity and then here's the cpu service usage right so we're talking about management processes associated with the microprocessor directly. Um, ordinarily, on many systems, you'll see CPU 0, 1, 2, and 3. Remember that for hardware devices, the first number is always 0. Everybody remembers that, yeah? And what you'd normally see is not this equal division of, see, I'm working with Windows resources right now. But if I were running lots of apps, the more apps that I load, the more you would see loads on CPU zero. Um, there is often a problem with the way that uh, multi-threaded operations allocate resources. Then typically it's not, they're not very well tuned as a hyper-threaded application, which means you'll see very high activity levels on CPU zero and then very low activity levels, one through unremaining uh, CPUs, right? 
So that's a very telling thing when you open up this resource monitor and you select the CPU tab and you look and what you see is an imbalance of activity between those. That's uh, a very plain indication that you're dealing with a lot of um, third party applications that are not uh, engineered to properly utilize a multi-threaded environment. Are there any questions about what I've just shared with you? Now, does everybody, does everybody see the GPU option here? Yeah. So one of the things that you are capable of doing in gaming and high performance workstations high performance computing platforms is that you can basically uh, run an application and run using the GPU. So if you have an NVIDIA card or you have an, a, you know, an ATI card, um, you can basically load the thing. And when you run the application, you can right click and there's an option to run in the, the GPU mode, which is really cool. Um, so that's another way that uh, applications can be crafted with um, multi-threading and multitasking in mind for high performance. So you do implement by separate threads. Process creation is heavyweight, while thread creation is lightweight. What we're saying here is, is that in terms of efficiency, you're better off creating fewer processes with multiple threads, and then um, resource use um, ramps up as your needs change, as opposed to software that you develop that, that creates new processes every time you turn around. If you simplify the code, you increase efficiency, and generally kernels are multi-threaded now. And again, uh, the software world is catching up in terms of um, taking full advantage of that. When you see multi-threaded server applications, this is where um, best case scenarios often play out. You have um, Google and Amazon data centers where the servers on the rack are providing resources to thousands of users. And so you have this server architecture with very large amounts of RAM and disk arrays. Uh, these are very large systems on the order of terabytes. And, and you're looking at um, you're looking you're looking at terabytes for RAM and petabytes for disk. The server is listening for client requests, and you see that the most efficient way to spin off support for an additional client, an additional client, client number three, client number four, client number five is to create new service threads instead of generating new processes. Have better response, a better resource sharing, um, it's cost effective, meaning it's cheaper to uh, basically build a process that's capable of scaling up or down based on the demand. And whenever you can take advantage of multiprocessor architectures, we just spoke about that. So that's one of the benefits of, of the focus on, on threads. Of course, multi-core and multi-processing systems. I don't know if you recall this toward the very end of CSC 241, we talked about different types of matrix or parallel computing and how you can have um, all of these different um, these different models. I'm going to put that in the resources folder, and uh, I may go ahead and add some things to the study guide just to include that information. But you do have overhead associated with multi-core and multi-processor utilization. So as you're managing the divesting divestiture dividing, right? You're taking tasks and you're breaking them down into smaller components and then you're farming those out to separate uh, cores, separate processors. You have to have an organized 
you have to have a framework to pull all that back together again. Because whenever you split data and um, there's process in the mix, you have these dependencies that evolve. So the overhead is significant whenever you're utilizing multi-core and multi-processor. This is one reason why ARM and RISC uh, devices and the Internet of Things is becoming so prominent. If you have a single, if you have a single purpose processor that's intentionally designed with uh, computer architecture, right? The computer engineering side of things. Uh, does everybody remember a reference to FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays? Almost like liquid chips. Now, this is a fascinating area of work. And basically, there's a lot of cutting edge research in this area where uh, you can restructure and redesign uh, a multi processor chip if it's an FPGA. And um, you can kind of tweak or tune the way that parallel and matrix uh, tasks are computed. So parallelism implies a system can perform more than one task simultaneously, while concurrency supports more than one task making progress. And there's a distinction there. So parallelism is a, a related concept to concurrency, but it's not the same. If you have parallel um, high performance computing systems, you're not talking about juggling tasks where you keep all the balls in the air and the time slices are so small it's imperceptible, right? You're talking about the ability to literally uh, take on more than one task at the same time uh, because you have so many processors to spare. Does everybody understand that distinction? I'm still kind of confused about the, the different. Okay. Have you, have you ever seen a juggler uh, juggling plates? They have multiple plates spinning on top of. Yeah. Okay. And what happens is that the juggler has to go from stick to stick to stick to spin them, spin them, spin them, spin them to keep the plates balanced. And if they don't take turns with each of those tasks, the plates start to fall. There are YouTube videos out there. Parallelism would be a case where you have a juggler and a single plate and a single stick, and they're each working only one task, but they're doing it at the same time. The plates are still spinning, they're still in the air, and it still looks magical, but how you keep them spinning and, and how you dedicate resources are completely different, right? So you do have an awful lot more uh, scheduler activity when you're working concurrency, um, but parallelism is the realm of multiprocessor and very large uh, platforms, very large servers. So here, basically taking a little bit more time to investigate the different types. You have data parallelism, so you're splitting up the data into separate sets across multiple cores, as opposed to task parallelism, distributing threads across cores, each thread performing a unique operation. So I want you to understand the, I want you to understand the correlation here between thread and task. Everybody remembers von Neumann, right? Please. Yeah. Don't. Okay, so I was going to say, please don't make me pull up a von Neumann diagram. Does everybody remember RAM? There were two components in RAM. Does anybody remember what those two components inside RAM were called? One was data, and what was the other one called? Instructions. Put another way, tasks, right? So what we're saying is, is that the contents of RAM, which are essentially data and programming instructions, right? Tasks, let's keep it simple, okay? 
when you're working parallel computing solutions and you're distributing the data and splitting the data into smaller chunks across different CPUs, that would be a case of data parallelism, as opposed to taking the tasks and splitting each separate instruction across cores. And as the number of threads grows, so does the architectural support for threading. CPUs have cores as well as hardware threads, right? So everybody knows Oracle, yeah? Everybody's heard of Oracle, the big database company? Yes, yeah. They own Java, right? They own VirtualBox, they own MySQL, but what do they own most? Oracle database, right? Well, they also purchased Sun. Sun um, was a corporation that was competing in the early days with IBM and with Microsoft. The Spark uh, workstation has custom chips that are designed in Silicon Valley with eight cores and eight hardware threads per core. Now, we just showed you a case with Intel. Uh, that's resource monitor CPU. How many logical processors do I have for two physical cores? Two. Two. Now I have two physical cores and I have four logical processors, which means the ratio is double, right? And that's how the chip is designed by Intel. What am I saying? In high performance workstations, you can have cases where you have eight cores and you have eight hardware threads per core. So What's the multiple there? How many, how many hyper-threaded cores do I have then for this scenario? Everybody remembers their multiplication tables? Eight cores times eight threads per core. How many hyper-threaded cores do I have? 64. 64 on a Spark with one T4 chip. You can purchase Sparks with multiple T4s. So you have multi-socket, multi-core, multi-threaded chips. If you have a spark with two, four sockets, you're looking at 128 cores. That's quite a beast, right? So this helps explain the difference again between concurrency versus parallelism. Remember that concurrency involves scheduling. And that's because time is sliced, right? And each task gets a little chunk of scheduled time on the CPU, as opposed to the parallelism. It's like the juggler, one juggler with multiple plates, and he's taking turns, she or he is taking turns spinning the plates, as opposed to multiple jugglers, each with their own dedicated plate, right? So on a multi-core system, you have simultaneous tasks that are executed each separately. Here's task one on core one, task two on core two, task three on core one, task four on core two, and then task one again, task two, see how see what's happening. So it's doing the concurrency drill, but it's also splitting the tasks up. Remember you have data, uh, data centric parallelism and task-centered parallelism. So in this case, we're splitting up the tasks. For a single and multi-threaded process, which one would provide better isolation for an application? Would, theoretically speaking or conceptually speaking, if you had multiple tasks to manage, which one do you think would provide the greatest isolation and uh, segmentation, boundaries between tasks. Single-threaded process or multi-thread, multiple cases of single-threaded processes or a single case of a multi-threaded process. 
which one do you think would provide a greater number of boundaries and stability and security? Uh, Multi-threading multi processes would exist within a single, so you'd have multiple threads in a single process, you'd have fewer boundaries between the threads, it would be more efficient. But you wouldn't have, you would not have uh, more borders and boundaries and segmentation. If you go this route, you have better security, but it's not as efficient. And uh, so there are trade-offs, basically. So what are we saying? Depending on the application and the tasks you're trying to compute, you may want to intentionally create multiple, even though it said, hey, it's, you know, it's considered best practice to have fewer processes with more threads. There is a trade-off. There may be high security instances where you want to have dedicated threads for a single process and there's more boundary and more isolation between those processes virtually speaking that would mean that there's uh that a crash with one application would be less likely to affect other aspects of the tasks being performed right in any case i want you to understand that we're sharing code, data, and files between the threads of a multi-threaded process, but each of the threads have their own dedicated registers and stack. Does everybody understand what we're saying here? For a single threaded process, all of this is reserved for a single thread, but in a multi-threaded process, code, data, and files are shared, but registers and stacks are devoted or provisioned for each of the threads separately. Everybody got that? Amdahl's law. So Amdahl's law basically says, if you have uh, a computing solution and it involves uh, parallelism and parallel methods, whether it's uh, data or task parallel methods, that essentially every time you split and involve more cores and more processors, the speed up is, everybody see here, so if I move from one to two cores, one would expect, oh, I'm going twice as fast, but the reality is you have to account for the overhead when you split data and split tasks and that management, there's a performance hit. So Amdahl's law is relevant and significant. You need to understand the main idea of Amdahl's law. And that is, is that when you uh, increase number of cores and sockets, you don't get you don't get a multiple of performance increases. There's a hit in terms of overhead. So instead of seeing double, right? So here's the formula for how much it'll speed up. You can actually calculate what the expected performance increase is. But let's do this on a simple in a simple manner, if we go from one to two cores, you would expect things to double. But instead, the speed up is 1.6 times, right? So essentially, that's a loss of 20%, I think. And here it says if the application is 75% parallel and 25% serial, so we're talking about Everybody understands the distinction between parallel and serial from computer architecture, yes? Yeah. Okay. So it all depends on how you design your system. And so you have a, a lot of uh, folks that are spending a huge amount of time doing this in supercomputing scenarios. 
<coughs> and in gaming scenarios, right? So whenever you use uh, gaming processors to improve performance, you have multiple cores in a GPU. And uh, But the emphasis for gaming processors is more floating point than generic or general computing. It says the serial portion of an application has a disproportionate effect on performance gained by adding additional cores. What does that mean in plain English? If you have a very large serial component of your computing solution, it's going to increase the overhead for the performance gain with multiple processors. Translation, the more you can do parallel with multiple processors, the the less the overhead and the greater the efficiency of the parallel solution. So serial increases the how how much of the how much of your solution uses uh, serial methods. That's going to decrease the performance gain of going multi-process or multi-threading. Okay. So here it says, but does the law take into account contemporary multi-core systems? Well, so to answer that question, you have different kinds of threads. And this kind of, this kind of translates to our previous review of operating system components from our first module you learned that there was something called user mode and kernel mode. Everybody remembers this? Yeah? Hello. Kernel mode has to do with low level access to hardware components. It's the touchiest, least stable and most privileged access on a system in terms of the operating system kernel. When you get closer to the user side of things, you're dealing with software and applications access. So user mode is further removed from the hardware. It's a greater distance from the hardware. And um, you don't have as many direct calls to operating system resources in the user arena. By the same token, you have user threads and kernel threads, right? So you have um, everybody see POSIX? We've talked about POSIX before, have we not? So who took up the POSIX interest to standardize operating system components so that there could be interoperability between operating systems? Was that a Microsoft thing, an IBM thing, or a Linux, Unix thing? Who took up that banner years ago? Unix, Linux, Sun operating system. So there was an there was an there was an effort in the industry to standardize operating system components to enhance interoperability. This thing is called POSIX. Um, that's waning. It's not as important anymore, even though it's you have a lot of systems that still utilize POSIX standards. Um, what's happening now is that um, you're seeing a lot of other efforts to improve interoperability or do away without incompatibilities altogether. We did mention uh, containerized apps, yes? And we did mention Windows subsystem for Linux, yeah? But anyway, so in the user mode, you have user threads and uh, the three types of thread libraries. We're gonna investigate these more completely. Deeper inside the kernel of the OS, the internals, um, 
you do see this in, in most major operating systems. Android would be listed here, of course. So any questions about the two different types of threads? No question. Which thread do you think would execute with greater privilege, user threads or kernel threads? Threads. Kernel threads is correct. Thank you. When you look at multi-threading, um, there is a very uh, logical way to think of multi-threading. So you have many to one, one to one, and many to many. Let's take a look at each. Many to one. So in this case, you have kernel threads with multiple user threads. This is an example of a many to one scenario. Okay. It says multiple threads may not run in parallel on multi-core system because only one may be in the kernel at a time. So this model does not allow for parallel stuff, um, but it is efficient, right? So Solaris green threads and new portable threads in Linux would be an example. And this is not commonly used uh, as much. So one to one. So you have a kernel thread to a user thread. Each user thread has a dedicated and corresponding kernel thread. You have more concurrency than many to one models. The number of threads per process is sometimes restricted due to overhead. What are we saying? We said every time you have separate processors, processes and more of them, that's not as efficient. So you run out of resources sooner. Examples of this include Windows, Linux, and Solaris 9 and later. So in terms of multi-threading models, one-to-one -one is very commonplace. Many-to-many -many allows many user-level threads to be mapped to many kernel threads allows the operating system to create sufficient number of kernel threads, Solaris prior to version nine and Windows with the thread fiber package. I guess there may be some high performance and supercomputing scenarios that would uh, do backflips to implement stuff like this, but um, yeah, I don't think that's uh, something that you would see thread fiber package. So the fun part is when you take the many to one, one to one and many to many models and um, you create hybrids with them. So the two level model is similar to many to many except that it allows a user thread to be bound to a kernel thread. Now this is something that you see uh, quite often in Unix and Linux. So the idea of binding a thread um, to another backend resource is actually pretty common. IRIX and HP Unix and Solaris, those were all early flavors of Unix, which are similar to Linux, but not the same. And I don't know how many of those are in play in industry right now. Any questions about different thread models? One to many, one to one, many to many, and two level. What do you find in Windows most often out of those four? One to one. All right, how's everybody doing? You still with me? Yeah. yeah. So our review of threads would not be complete without reference at some point to an application programming interface, API. And uh, obviously 
if we have a if we have a process API, uh, we have to have a thread API, right? So this is where thread libraries come into play. Uh, operating systems provide access to resources or specific components through APIs. And uh, essentially you create a thread and manage a thread. So you have to have those libraries and functionality built into an operating system. In this case, you have two ways of provisioning thread libraries on operating systems. You can basically build out a library for th a thread API so that it's exclusively located within the user space, or you can have kernel level library supported by the OS. And so what are we saying? Kernel level library support would be important for this kind of model. Can everybody see? So you have a kernel level backend to the user side application. You can put everything out in the user space or you can have a thread library that includes components for both. Um, this is the primary interest here. P threads. So now we're talking about each of the different kinds of user threads. P thread is a user level thread and it's a uh, primary interest uh, for the to enhance to enhance interoperability. You see here that there's actually an IEEE standard associated with the POSIX uh, P thread. And this is actually pretty old, but you'll notice that the Mac OS X, right? A lot of times people say, well, Mac operating system is pretty much like a Linux system. Uh, people from Apple computing will argue up and down that, that their operating system isn't really a variant of Linux, but it's, it's a descendant of the legacy Unix um, world. And uh, they'll have lots of very strong rationale to argue that, but why, why do you care? Um, it's important to understand the world of pthreads because if you're doing things in a Mac OS environment and interoperability with other operating systems like Windows is important, then you need to understand this, right? The other thing that I would that, that's in bold here is that it's it's a specification, meaning there the P thread standard basically spells out the criteria for how um, to what standard you're going to create user level threads, but it doesn't tell you how to do it. So if you you look up the standard, it's, it, it tells you how and to what degree you create the components, but it doesn't tell you, it, it's not something you can pick up and run with and then implement, right? So that's different as a type of user thread because it's up to the developers to figure out how to implement what's in the standard. I don't know if I, does that make sense? And that's distinctly different than the other types of user threads, which um, are more uh, get it done application. This is how you do it kind of scenario. So if, you, if I show you a copy of the code and you see pthread in the mix, I'm going to say, is this a kernel level or a user level thread? You'll be able to say, oh, that's user level, right? Yes? Hopefully. So yeah, this is a great example of how to create the um, 
many scenarios, you know, one to many, many to many, and uh, hybrid. In Windows, this is more of the one to one scenario where you have a backend kernel thread that's associated with a user thread. And obviously, the giveaway here is Win API, right? So you see something that says Win API. So we're dealing with a Windows environment. The parameters, well, the, the, the attributes for the thread creation are included. If you remember this diagram right here, Everybody remember this? When you're building out multi-threaded processes in Windows, you have to specify these things in your parameters. That's what you're seeing here. Right? the resources you need to build that. Uh, you can actually pick out the same details. You should put that diagram right next to here. You can see some, some things directly correlated. Java threads, right? Managed by the Java virtual machine. Did, I know we asked about processes in Java. Has Dr. Bomadine done anything with you with regard to Java threads? Hello? Anyone? So what's the dead giveaway on this screen that we're dealing with Java? What do you see on this screen that would tell you it's a Java multi-threaded program? The classes. Uh, classes. Yes. yes, thank you. Okay. So it's pretty, pretty straightforward when you're looking at code examples of what does what. And uh, if you see code samples, I, you know, I may ask you, I think it's fair to ask questions. What, what kind of user thread am I looking? What you know am I looking at with regard to this code? And you're going to go, okay. Well, I see class that has to be Java, right? So implicit threading. Implicit threading means basically. A process understands that there's a multi-threaded context and it, I think one way of describing implicit threading is to say threading on autopilot. Okay, so, and as you're developing solutions and you're building in thoughts about how best to provision multi-threaded um, resources. Implicit threading is kind of like an easy button. So, you know, there's some automatic um, resource allocation that plays out there. So these things are handled on the back end. You don't have programmers coding for this, but essentially there's... Um, it's an easy button. If you see OpenMP thread pools or Grand Central Dispatch, what we're saying is these are examples of the easy button, the auto threading methods. Okay. They're examples of implicit threading. 
and specifically TBB, it's a Microsoft concept. Whenever you see the Java concurrent package, that's implicit threading. Any questions about implicit threading? Thread pools. So if you're performing implicit threading, if you're using the easy button, uh, thread pools is an important and related concept, right? So what are we saying? Uh, you have threads that are ready and waiting to work. And so you have better performance when there's a service request. And uh, you can allocate a certain number of threads for a given application. So you can bind a certain resource, so many threads for this application versus that application. So thread pools is something that's supported in Windows. And uh, that's something that's something you want to remember. Any question about thread pools? Open MP. Um, so think Linux in this context and Unix. So this is um, something that you see quite a bit in supercomputing and high performance computing arenas. Grand central dispatch. So whenever you see that you're dealing with Mac OS and iOS systems. This is a way of working the automagic way of providing multi multiple threads. So Grand Central Dispatch, I want you to associate that with Mac and iOS. Has anyone here had any experience coding for the Mac or iOS environments? Um, yeah, I'm on Mac OS. Oh, okay. So when you're working with Grand Central Dispatch, everybody remember FIFO and Philo, first in, last out, first in, first out? From yeah. computer architecture, right? And that should ring a bell with your CSC 242, I think, right? Threading issues. Uh, threading issues have to do with challenges. Things you have to manage well in order for threads to be utilized properly in an operating system. I think this would be a good stopping point So, but you're seeing here that there are some terms that tie back to concepts we've already covered in our first module and earlier in our chapter three review on processes, right? So you have scheduling and signaling, synchronous and asynchronous. And um, fork and exec, we've seen that before but there are specifics about how those are called that can be a challenge. We'll pick that up on Thursday and please complete your installation of the Sys internals resources between now and the start of class on Thursday. Any questions before we clear? <laughs>